Good evening, colleagues. Um, welcome to another evening of conversation that provides us with an opportunity to have an insight into the amazing world of primary care. I am Mohit Bankatram. I'm the Executive Director of Primary Care at East London Foundation Trust. When East London Foundation Trust agreed to develop the primary care directory, we were of the view that every action we took jointly to improve the resilience of primary care will help us provide better care to our residents. And when the primary care was set up, it was set up as individual organizations. So often the ability of individual GPs to learn from each other is restricted consequent to the organizational designs we have provoked. This learning space we have created, aptly called the future of primary care, helps create that space through ELFT. And we have been inviting a number of speakers for the last year. We have had Ursula, the National Clinical Director of Primary Care, the Chief Exec of Modality, Vincent, and the Chief Exec of Accurix, Jacob Haddad, all amazing speakers who are shaping tomorrow's primary care. This open, honest conversation has allowed us to jointly grow as a community and better understand what can help us improve the outcomes for our residents. In the month of February alone, primary care offered 25.7 million appointments to residents across UK. Of these, 45% of appointments were same day appointments. So we are talking nearly half the patients of the 25 million receiving care the same day. 92% of us attended the care, so the DNA rate wasn't bad at all. But if we were, this, this, this support we provided is far in excess of what secondary care provided in the same time. So if we really wanted primary care to continue and to provide the best care for all of us, you, me, our families, friends, we really need to rethink a model because if we expect the 12,000 GPs in UK to provide 25 million appointments each month, we'll be asking for the impossible. Our speaker today is one such army veteran who changed the impossible to the possible. He tore the rule book apart and started creating a completely new model of primary care. Those old days of picking up the phone at 8.30 in the morning, so that after the 470th call, you get an appointment with the GP, is a thing with the past with Dr. David Trisco. His model is both resilient, provides great care, and importantly, moves same-day care from the 50% that we have provided across the country to nearly 100%. Wouldn't that be amazing if you and I needed care to be able to access the GPs or to be able to access primary care from the right professional on the same day? Today, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Triska, who has led this new model. Before I hand over to him so he can share his model, a couple of rules. We will be recording this because many of you have fed back that you would like to have the leisurely time to hear this recording again. So this is being recorded. So please be aware. Secondly, I'm sure you'll have some amazing questions to post through. Many of you have already been emailing me your questions. Please use the chat function 
within the um, Zoom, and I will then pull out themes from those questions you present and be able to share them with Dr. Triska. So without further ado, I'll hand over to our guest speaker, Dr. Triska. David, welcome to this session. Good evening, thanks for having me. Um, and thank you very much for all of you to uh, who've attended tonight. So I'll just get my presentation up and then hopefully we can start. Um, I presume that's displayed correctly. Excellent. Yeah. Um, the hardest oh. thing about this evening was trying to work out what I was going to call the talk because I'd never really thought of myself as delivering a model of care uh, that was different to anyone else's. And indeed, I, I don't think that I've come up with this on my own and have built on the work that many others have done. And I realized that the main thing that I'd considered over the last few years was not being stuck in one model. And so the title of the talk tonight is about adaptive general practice. And I hope I can illustrate what I mean by that to you. Many of you will share uh, some or all of the principles and ethoses that I'll discuss, but I'll take you through a journey of how we started with this several years ago, uh, what kind of practice we were, because I think it's important to know where someone has come from. And then I'll talk you through where we are now and where I think the future may be. And then of course, I'd be happy to receive questions towards the end of the talk. So I've, I'm a nine session partner in a Surrey surgery. It's 11,400 patients and we have four partners. Um, we have our own challenges and our own benefits. And the picture there is our, our tiny car park. We're in a residential area and the building with a pointed roof at the back is our surgery. Um, we are the longest lived area in the whole of the United Kingdom with high levels of extreme frailty with most people living in their own homes. So for my surgery, we only actually have one nursing home with the vast majority of people being cared for at home. It's been a huge population growth, which has outstripped our local uh, resources in terms of both buildings and infrastructure, because we're a commuter belt practice. So as people have left London over the last 10, 20 years, uh, the area has grown significantly in size, and that's not always been commensurate with the growth in health and social care staffing. Having said that, we do have our own advantages in that because of where we are, we've mostly up until recently been able to avoid staffing gaps. And we are one of the more developed ICS regions with Surrey Hartland's ICS, who most of you may have heard of, um, and are considered relatively progressive in terms of both GP modelling and working in collaboration with secondary care. So I want to take you back a few years now. So I tried to pick a time and 2017 seemed appropriate as it was five years ago and roughly when we started our journey. So we were very different then as a practice and actually offered no remote appointments at all. I think it would be uh, fair to say that we were considered an extremely traditional rural country general practice. So there were no phone appointments with GPs. There were no uh, text messaging services. There were no online services and people were only seen face to face. The model that had been employed was that there was no duty doctor. So there were two uncapped emergency clinics per day, which ran at lunchtime and in the afternoon, uh, with little to no triage of those other than by our administrative staff. We had an extremely high home visit rate. Uh, patients were booked directly for them. There were no housebound requirements for them. And each GP was expected to pick up three or four appointments per day like that. And we had little or no structured recall in terms of long-term conditions. So people were seen essentially uh, ad hoc for their long-term condition management, either based on uh, condition recall, which may have been specific to the condition or not, and sometimes didn't exist, or when finally the slip on their paper prescription reminded them that they may need to visit the GP. So it's a model that many people would recognize if you've worked in rurality before, um, you can see how very different it is from where we are today. And I think if I could transport that practice into 2022, we would be providing uh, a level of care that wouldn't be sufficient for our population needs. Having said that, I obviously joined it for a reason, and it wasn't because I was unhappy with the way things were. It was a lovely practice to be, and it was a nice place to work. And so one might wonder uh, why we changed. So this is a picture of me in... 
2015 in my previous job. So the smile on my face is because I've just returned from my second tour of duty in Afghanistan. And that was my very last moment in uniform. Uh, with me is my little child who's just been born and my son. And at that point, life seemed good as I was about to join the NHS. Unfortunately, like many service people, I became ill after that particular tour of duty and needed to seek care for my own mental health, having developed post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, not unusual for army medics and certainly not particularly special to me as it was very common, but it did require that having left the military, that I accessed the local healthcare systems for my own excellent registered GP surgery. And what I found was that one size didn't fit all for everyone. So I was a clinician trying to navigate the NHS that I knew well and trying to provide care for myself and looking after myself and my family. And despite my own GP being excellent and his staff being extremely kind and considerate, I faced for the first time as a patient the services as they were structured with the eight o'clock uh, call on the day, trying to get appointments booked and finding myself having an extremely long four weeks wait for my own official first appointment to be uh, triaged into care. I couldn't honestly say that I was uh, urgent as people would deem it necessary in general practice. So I didn't have something that was immediately life-threatening. I didn't have something that needed treatment that day. But I realised that I wasn't able to communicate my needs to my GP through any effective way. And for myself, it was one of the longest months of my life. I started to think about how could we change how we deliver care in my own practice because I suddenly had an epiphany and realized that the care that I thought was so good for my patients was somewhat based upon a lottery about who could bring the quickest, who would be the most persistent and often there were times when people's care was either missed because they couldn't access us and there was a great unknown of people who weren't able to, sit, to see us and probably didn't get the attention that they deserved. I had a very simple ethos about what this may be, and really this was all about communication. Although much of the talk and much of what I'm known for in general practice revolves around technology, it's really about communication between patients and doctors. Uh, patients need to be able to communicate problems to us. Wasted time harms patients. So we may think that we can assist them by sitting with us, but how many times have we sat with someone and had to go actually, I don't really have all the things that I need to help you take the next step forward, be it their investigations or input from other clinical staff. It was clear early on in this journey that despite the best wishes of many of the profession, indeed the IT industry, computers can't think for us. And GPs themselves and their allied healthcare professionals provide a service that I don't think any computer is close to replicating. What it can do is do boring and repetitive tasks for us, and I particularly like to think about this as data gathering from patients. And it frees up clinical time and clinical brain power to do the things that we need to do, which is to get people into the care that they need with the right person at the right time. That was really the basis of my own journey and the, the basis of how we started to transform our practice. I've picked a painting particularly for this because the, these were the constraints that we faced. And at times it seemed an impossible task. You've heard of where we came from. So we had problems in thinking of how we might staff this new model of care. So it was very GP focused practice. There was an extreme fear of failure, which I think permeates the NHS in general. So we're all very good at being safe with patients, but we do fear if we change things or do things differently, could we bring harm to them or could we make the service worse? Equilibrium in the NHS is something that you see everywhere and the status quo has always been the way things are and people are often reluctant to change what they feel may be the best model available. At the time, technology was relatively limited and there were only very early entries into online computing particularly. And we worried about whether or not patients would comply with this, this brave new world having been forced to ring at eight o'clock each morning to try and get appointments with GPs or face the average wait of four to six weeks that many of us would recognize. But it's actually easy to think about how we might transform general practice because we all want the same thing really. It's just about taking the steps together. First of all, we want a service that works. You need it to be safe. We need staff that are happy so they can carry on working within it. 
and we actually want our patients to be happy too and that partly uh, as we might face at the moment adversarial relationships with the patients hinder our interactions and care with them but it just makes for a much more rewarding job and i think people would look upon any workplace that they're happy to interact with their clients or customers depending on how you view them uh, it's going to be somewhere where you want to be and that they're happy to be when i think about what stops people from doing this and why i make might be different in some of the ways that i thought about things was the concept of what i'd refer to as rigid failure uh, the phrases that i heard the most often were things like we've always done it like this what if it doesn't work people might not like it and people might not like me. I think many of us would recognise that in our role in healthcare, we do like to be liked, and we do like to be wanted by people. But I came from a background where it wasn't acceptable to be rigid and structured outside of regimented life on barracks. When you're actually employing yourself in forward duties, it simply isn't possible to be like that, and one has to adapt. And the situations are always changing. When we look about what we actually need to do in general practice, there are extremely good reasons to change, which those rigid failure reasons sometimes prevent us from doing. I've lost track of the number of people who feel that we're in a position that can't go on indefinitely, are starting to recognise that what we've done before might not be the way of the future, and general practice has changed forever. What do we do to make something that will last for the next 10 to 20 years, input from governments aside? And will we have care that and patients that miss out because we haven't changed. The reason why people think that we may be better where we are is often misplaced, that it's the best way and the safest way. And actually sometimes, even with forward tentative steps, people don't actually lose out the benefits, even if there are stumbles along the way. It's a well-recognized concept of iterative design, both within the technology world and secondary care and primary care. But it's the first steps to what we started to do. That inertia, the equilibrium, was overcome with just taking small changes initially. So uh, something that would be uh, of no note to most practices was as introducing uh, a trialled phones-only appointment. And to our surprise, patients actually preferred that to, for the vast majority of people who contacted us. And we started to think that maybe we weren't doing the right thing after all offering face-to-face -face appointments, which is, which is what we thought they always wanted from us. The proof of concept was trials. We re-evaluated as we went. And actually at all these points, the iterative part of it was getting to the end of that cycle and going, is this still the right thing and not getting embedded in that equilibrium. And from that, we started to look at the best way of transmitting communications between patients and staff. But how do we do it and not break the system along the way? So the figures represent our practice population. We've got a relatively top heavy practice population due to our commuter group and our elderly patients. So how do we do it and not disadvantage them? How do we make sure that those people who need us aren't lost out and there isn't a highway that other people can overtake them on when actually they're the ones with the most need? It's easy, really. We really want to make it as easy for patients as possible. So a huge way that we changed what we did was to offer the easiest level of access that we could with very little barriers. Um, whenever I use services, the thing that I do is the thing that is easiest for me. And as much as we try and fight the system and fight the way that people behave, actually, if we get them to do the things that we want to do because it's the easiest thing for them, we can both benefit from that, both in terms of their experience, a quality of access for patients, and actually protect our, protecting ourselves from things that don't work for us. Patient service is important, but actually we have to retain our staffing. So how do you do this in practice? Um, I tried to think of the, a phrase for it, and this is what I've termed manoeuvre medicine. So manoeuvre medicine is really the thought about never getting stuck in one place. And while we came to a point that's a very long way away from where we started, it wasn't something that happened overnight. So we implemented something that looked roughly like this. So we had daily checks as things do occur rapidly and we accepted that things might not work and would probably fail along the way. The point being that as we reacted quickly to them and changed it, we got them better and that iterative design process was embedded throughout the practice. 
I think the major point that I would make is along the way, accepting that perfect was never going to work was a very important step. So aiming for perfection means being static and not changing because it's very rare that in healthcare that you can make a perfect system. You can make a better system, but aiming for the impossible means that you never move forward. The world changes quicker than we do and patients are adapting quickly to it. And this is what brought us to this model of adaptive practice where we're not really stuck in one system at all. We're actually uh, crossing many different ways of practicing, even from day to day and week to week. So I, I mentioned about the information technology side of things, but really this is just a means of getting information to clinicians. So what does our practice look like on a, a daily basis? Well, we actually have clinicians working in teams sat together so we don't really have people sat in rooms isolated anymore as much as we can avoid it because the point of having all that information is to have blended workforces with different expertise so actually as the cases come into us through um, equal routes really so we treat them both the same so whether or not people contact us in person on the phone or online it's all treated the same way in terms of prioritization and the same clinical team will start to look at it so we started to split our teams into uh, both long-term condition care and what we just termed as uh, acute care. So we try, try to divide routine and urgent work didn't seem to work because actually lots of things were urgent to patients and we realised that many of the things that we thought weren't urgent actually needed more attention. So that same day working wasn't just simply for convenience, it was due to clinical need and the blended workforce with people sharing a case so as things were starting to be reviewed and we were deciding what to do with people there might be discussions in the same room with our nurse practitioners our clinical pharmacists and the gps uh, multiple gps often to work out what the best route for this patient was when the final interaction happens that patient has had a case review and is put into the place of the best clinical um, resolution for their care so it might be a gp it might be a pharmacist, it might be a physiotherapist. It sounds obvious, but the main difference is that there's a joint decision-making process that happens at the start of it. And there's no assumption that one thing fits all for each particular clinical need. So really we have a, a what is a very simple system, but the adaptive part of it is the fact that we can change it on the fly. So there is no structured process to the practice anymore in terms of set appointment lengths there is no set appointment slots with who it needs to go to there are clearly clinics for clinicians but we don't make an assumption that we know what's best for that person at the point of contact until we've started to work out what happens with them and really that problem that we start with is all about pulling together data from the patient using computers where we can because computers are good at pulling lots of information quickly from someone and asynchronously so for patients, a lot of them prefer time that they can spend either formulating their thoughts and putting things to us in a structured format, uh, or it, they may prefer to talk to us directly, but essentially a lot of the time that we spend in direct contact with patients is about decision making. So when we decide to do things, the team decide together and then executes this together. And we have follow-ups with people that are prioritized based on need. So not all follow-ups, in fact, most of our follow-ups now happen virtually. So People mostly, as to our surprise along this way, didn't want to come and see us in person for most routine care. They wanted to have follow-ups, which we use with scheduled messaging and scheduled online appointments with us. And we're happy to do that, meaning that actually the time that we freed up was employed with the most needy patients, the ones who needed to be in clinic with us, either because they had physical needs that needed that, or simply it was the thing that suited them the best. Clearly, it wouldn't be adaptive if we weren't flexible. So this doesn't mean that we should prioritize one type of care over the other. So for example, as you probably will experienced over the last few days, we've shifted the team into roles that suit what really was uh, felt like being a, a, an acute emergency department at times this week. And rather than trying to prioritize things that would wait for longer and rigidly sticking to a previous system that we might otherwise have done so. So the point of enabling all these technologies, the routes into access, the virtual review appointments and changing a system on a day to day basis with that maneuver medicine is it trying to enable and not disable people from accessing care. Um, the most common refrain I hear is that we should put barriers into place 
uh, from pe from patients accessing is because it's too easy. And I don't mean within my own surgery, but just from having done this sort of talk several times. And for my own needs and for my own patients' needs, I know that that often is is counter to the best practice simply because most times um, both clinician and patient need to have a conversation about how they're best met in terms of their needs. And sometimes people who think they're not very well are actually quite okay. And sometimes people who think they're absolutely fine are really quite unwell and need the highest level of care with the most experienced clinician. So enabling this means that we can actually have a model that suits both patients and clinicians alike, that we have a, a, a way that it works that we can flex to, we can have remote working, we can have people being seen in clinic really as they need to be seen and as quickly as within a couple of hours is that our current face-to-face -face appointment time and making sure that we actually deliver that good structured long-term condition care because we have computers aiding us with the bits, the data gathering that enable clinicians to make decisions. So what might be the future of general practice? And um, that was clearly one of the goals of this lecture series and, and I wouldn't be a part of it if I didn't actually comment. Well, I, I, I think in terms of where technology lies, I don't think it's ever going to replace general practice. And I've indeed uh, been opposed to using AI, for example, to uh, triage out clinical appointments or make decisions for clinicians, because I think clinicians are the best people to do that. We've got the most experience in our patients. I do think technology augments our decision making. I do think it augments our data gathering. And I do think it assists us in monitoring patients from afar, enabling us to prioritize the care that we can deliver. I can't really see a return to the general practice model that was A, because there's really not enough clinicians to deliver that, and B, because I think the nature of the care that we provide has changed forever over the last five to 10 years. Um, the care that we delivered once upon a time is now gone. And often at times it feels more like we're a hybrid mix of acute emergency physician, general physician, mental health practitioner and orthopedic surgeon. So to go back to ways that we used to work would disadvantage those people who need our experience the very most. I hope that's been helpful and I hope it has given some food for thought. Um, I'll be happy to pause now and I, I hope we have some chaired questions and answers. Thank you, David. What an amazing presentation. Should we take that down so that we are down? This was absolutely amazing, David. Thank you. Thank you so much for what we've just heard because it was the one of the most honest exposés that I have heard about a clinician sharing their experience of being a patient in the system, experiencing that, and you have this epiphany, and golly, this system needs to be better, isn't it? If, if I can't navigate it with these, um, and all our beliefs that we have been providing the best care get shaken. So thank you so much for taking the bull by the horns, making a difference, and actually, genuinely changing something that people don't think can be changed. And I, I so love the terms today, uh, adaptive care, maneuver medicine, because what they did do, they truly reflected what the future of general practice is. And it also reflects the changing need for patients, because as a patient, I don't want to be hanging on a phone for an appointment. As a patient, I don't want to be taking half a day off to stand and come and see a GP for 10 minutes, while often I would just get referred on to the physiotherapist or to, the, uh, to someone else in the multidisciplinary team. Sometimes I do want to be seen by the patient, or by the GP. So I think it was phenomenal to have this conversation and get a better feel. Now, uh, a number of uh, questions that have been emailed, questions that are being posted, I think, a couple of people have already started saying how inspiring they found the talk. So clearly it's hit a nerve with many of us and made us feel today is an evening that's really counting and making a difference. And I think, um, David, I'll start by asking some of the questions. And clearly you shared how your experiences shaped this. You also had a really good understanding of the population you were talking about, what percentage of them were children, what percentage of them were elderly. How did 
the patients, how were they involved in this process of creating the new um, model of general practice, the adaptive care that you're providing? And what is the ongoing model of involvement with patients in your practice so that they can have an ongoing say as you generate the newer models that keep providing better care? So we, along the way, very early on in the journey, as we started to look at, was this the right thing to do? Started to do small test pilots with patient groups with each phase of what we were doing. So there was a moment where there was, a, a I think the term is a big bang change, where overnight we did a very big shift. But before that, we started to look at in, uh, just very small changes and what was the patient feedback on it. Um, probably counter to narrative we actually have a very active social media presence um it does uh, on some occasions when i've seen gp practice sites and facebook sites and similar it's felt a bit like a full contact sport but it's actually been quite open to have direct patient feedback and involvement along the way uh, i think that has to be caveated with we are experts in healthcare delivery so we know what is possible and probable and can be done within constraints of services that are available so whilst i think our patients informed much of our decision making i would comment that if we had stayed with an equilibrium that was there then we may never have moved forward because patients like most people um they're human beings just like us and, and are worried about could this be worse than it was before but i always say to people as they do these things we've done you know, a number of different practice change programs you can always go back so none of these decisions are final decisions you don't have to ever get stuck in one way of working i i i think it's such a such a powerful statement what you just said and it goes to the heart of every change we try has to be driven by the experience of the patients the experience that care and then it has to have a very strong input into how we take that forward in a substantive way, because we could, it, it, it's absolutely fine to abandon the model we start with. And it was really nice to see the honesty in your slides, which started talking about, we might fail. There might be things that will not work and what do we do to make it better? So I think uh, some, some really powerful questions coming through in terms of, how does the model work, the details of the model? But let me pull out the theme. One of the key themes that seems to be very strongly coming through is what was the reaction of the wider clinical teams? Because in the old model, the GPs took the brunt of the workload. Now the expectation was those roles which had a different profile were suddenly coming to the fore. How did they find it? What was their experience? Well, I think it's been a great development in terms of cl clinical training for our uh, allied healthcare professionals because much of what we do in terms of working together with them and decision making and, and case finding for them means that there there is almost that not senior support but different practice practitioner support for them. So things are always assisted um we're always you know there with them as they're seeing cases i don't mean literally in the room but available because of the way that we work the response from patients initially was uh, doubt and um a thought that people might not well we're not we're not we're getting fobbed off with some of the thoughts and it's been really open the way that we've been able to do this and having a conversation with a you know a clinician it's usually a gp who I've um, I've turned it quarterbacking the, the team rather than duty doctor, but it, you know we can have that conversation with patients. You know, with our physios at the moment, I say, look, I don't know why you think I'd be better at helping your need than someone who's done a degree in it. And you know, we can have that conversation. I think that feels a very different patient journey to being told, no, you you may only see this person, you can't see a GP. I think that's a different discussion. The outcome's probably the same but the way that you get there is different. And, and patients who have an urgent need get care much quicker than they were getting in the previous system, which was all sequential. 
you come in first, you get the first appointment. You come in second, you get the second appointment. Now with your triage system, it must be so much more clinically uh, appropriate and the care more adaptive. It, well, indeed, yeah. So I, um, in one of the slides, I said about wasted time is harmful to patients. And the reason is that, uh, personal belief, if you're doing something that you don't need to do in a time that you don't need to do it in the wrong order, that's time that you should have been spending with someone who needs you and only you alone can deliver the care for them. So, um, you know, our clinical staff and GP surgeries are extremely valuable. So the time that we spend with patients need to be uh, important and, and with an outcome. So like you say, having people attend to see a clinician who says, actually, I really can't take this forward for you without any further investigations. You're going to have to go away for them, rebook an appointment with me, come back. It, it's time for the patient and who knows if they'll actually come back and it's time that the clinician could have spent doing something differently. So I, th I think that's, it, people talk about efficiency, but I, I prefer to think of it as getting all your ducks in a row and doing it in the right order. I, I'm, I'm systematic in that, in the sense that I think there's a way that you can get people to a point that when you sit down with a clinician, there's an idea about where you might go at that point. Um, and it gives confidence in the clinician and the clinical team. And also it means that patient care, you, you're delivering more care for people that has an effect. Um, a lot of it is about cause and effect. And I think every time you do things as a clinician, you have a duty to have an effect um, and not just act as, a, I mean, sometimes, you know, I know we do watch and wait, but it's even that is, I would say, an effect. We're doing something for that person, not just um, holding on to them and hoping things change. Very helpful. Very, very helpful, David. And, and there seem to be so many questions around um, your focus on using digital tools as an enabler rather than um, using the AI itself to uh, triage. And people are um, interested, intriguingly, on do you use the digital tool at all or any form of AI in the triaging function, or is it completely clinician-based? Uh, well, we do actually. So, uh, so uh, first of all, I should think I should say whatever tools that you pick, I think it, it needs to suit the way that you want to operate. So, I don't think there's a wrong or right tool for people. Um, you know, we've got a particular set that we use because it suits our ethos and what we want to do. Um, I think augmented decision making is important. So one of the uh, adjuncts we have to our triage tool is uh, a, a symptom checker, which is a hybrid symptom checker, enabling people to um, pull across multiple sets of symptoms and essentially create a differential list. So clinicians can use that and patients to actually, uh, well, I'm thinking of a, a couple of examples, people with polysymptomatic multi-system disorders that might actually be very difficult for human beings to recognize. I believe that as expert generalists in our heads at any one time, we have about five to 600 diagnoses and there's about 15 to 16,000 that are recognized. So to think that we as clinicians can hold all that in our heads is ridiculous. And actually that's what computers are good at. So uh, we may not all be very good at spotting extremely complex pattern recognition. We can do th common things commonly, but that's where I think there's a difference between using AI only to do the whole triage process and using it to augment clinical decision making. Um, I'm sure one day in the future, there will be an AI that can do that. I just don't think, just my opinion, I don't think it's very, very close at the moment. I think it's better as an adjunct. And, and I think this links back to a conversation we had a few months ago with Jacob Haddad the chief exec of Acurex, when he spoke about the fact that digital means only go so far. The clinical involvement in that development and decision-making is really important to get the right outcome for patients. And of course, it's a strong enabler. And of course, it helps improve efficiency of delivery. And, and you spoke eloquently about remotely being able to monitor people with long-term conditions and provide them good care. But I think there's a balance of how that is put in place and how that's utilized. And it's fascinating to hear it from someone like you who's been very experienced. And I think many people are really keen to understand this model is very different from today's model of primary care. And you've been doing this for some time. How long did it take you to develop? Because 
this is not just about a process. This is about hearts and minds. This is about being able to get every clinician in the surgery to adapt and adapt to it. And also get every patient to feel the comfort. So with a list size of 11,000, you need to have enough of a mass of patients who say, actually, that's the model that gives us the best care. What are your views on that for people who would like to look at this? It's a really good point about bringing people along with you and how you do that. And I think part of that is, rec first of all, recognition that going back to 100% makes it impossible. You're never going to get 100% of people to agree with you. You'll never get 100% of patients to agree with you. You'll never get 100% of clinicians to agree with you. Our job is to do the most for the most. And you know, that has to be accepted. I think in terms of providing the change, then I think in some respects it's easy. I mean, first of all, I say easy, but the concept easy is that first of all, you have to show people that what you're about to do is better for both them and better for both patients. So, um, I, you know, I talk to lots of companies about various different things that they've got that bolt on to general practice, might aid us. And the bit I always say to them is, how does this help the clinician and what does it make their day feel like? Because it might be great, but if you make the clinician's day worse, they're not going to want to do it. The second thing is for patients. Um, it, it, you know, it's a little bit like uh, using really clunky online banking. You know what you do? You pick up the phone. So if you make things that are worse for people to use, they won't use them and they won't do it. So in some respects, the concept's easy. Is, uh, I often use the analogy, and apologies for people who've heard me use it before, but it's like trying to guide water running down a hill. You don't just push it, you make a channel for it to go down and you let the water run itself down. And I think that's how you lead people and bring people along with you, is that you make that the way that makes a sense for the most people. And, and, and David, you're so right when you say you create a channel for that water because general practice has been besieged by DNA rates. It's been the our bare general practice for very long because when a number of people do not attend the practice, actually that's appointments someone else could have used and someone else could have had that access and would probably not have ended up in any &E in due course, would have got better care. And, and it's very common to see practices with a 20% DNA rate despite people working really hard. Have you found a correlation with this model where People now have access on the same day compared to the DNA rate you had previously. And, and what was the feedback of that? Yeah, so uh, I don't bother measuring our DNA rate anymore because it's, it's almost non-existent. So um, we, that's, that's nothing special about this particular model, although it helps. But there's lots and lots of evidence that the further the appointment is away is for people, the higher the rate of DNA is. is. Um, Interestingly, having access has also had a, a spin on effect, which is actually about uh, watchful waiting. So we, ha we have people who are much happier with watchful waiting for things that we know are minor illnesses because they know they can access us. So far from having to sort of beat a path to the emergency clinic or however you term it, um, they're much happier because they can access us again if they need to, e even within the same day if things deteriorate. So a good example is with minor illness in children. Uh, which we can you know, safely hold at arm's length if we're clinically confident. So that actually has a, a great side effect, which is uh, rework is, is reduced as well. So um, the failure demand, I think, is a well-recognized phenomenon. So if you have uh, input to a system and the response is either slow or delayed, then that regenerates work as people then start to recontact or start to retriage themselves. And again, that comes because... Um, access is, is imp improved in this system, you see that much less. Not never, there's never, never, um, but much less. And I, and I think it's a very honest reflection when you say people tend to forget their appointments when it's six days in advance, seven days in advance, 20 days in advance. It, then you know you can access your GP when you need the GP, and you can access your clinicians when you need the clinician and you can access the therapist when you need the therapist why would you want to then unnecessarily book an appointment which you know you're going to forget 20 hours in advance so i think it's a really good example of how the dna rates can be massively changed and improve the experience of clinicians because none of us really want to sit around having nothing to do
and just have a patient not turn up because that's not what we all practice for. So it's a really good example of how people do it. And people people want different things now, isn't it? I mean, um, uh, many people are very well versed with Dr. Google. My daughters are. They seem to be able to know everything about diabetes, even things I don't know about it. And it's, it's really interesting how they're more awakened. People are well aware of their care. And how do people take to actually owning care? Because this model is not about care where your practice is prodding you on a call recall basis. This is a model where patients own their care. They come when they need it. They're able to access care as and when it's needed. How have you found this model supporting that uh, change in how patients think the healthcare services can be accessed? Well, I think to caveat it, you know, we, we do still have structured recall. Clearly, there are conditions that need annual reviews and various things. So it would be clinically irresponsible to have nothing. However, for most things, uh, you know, where we're let's just call them sort of short term illnesses or short term flare ups or however you wish to term it. So actually having uh, that hybridized care. So, you know, we've got the initial entry into the system, the data finding, the journey with the clinician and the patient working together to come to a diagnosis, then a management plan. And then actually somewhat stepping away from the, the paternalistic view of medicine and allowing patients some room to go through that themselves. So, you know, um, I, I think most people know me when I do a lot of the mental health consultations and actually trying to work towards patients having um, ownership of their, their own health is both enabling uh, them to recover in, in a way that feels better for them and also is probably protective for clinicians as well. So us utilizing those virtualized reminders, utilizing check-ins that aren't necessarily uh, synchronous check-ins. Um, and for the what does that look like for the population well it means that you you know you do find those needles because the vast majority of people are just hay in the haystack when you're doing these follow-ups with them and they're okay and they're doing fine but it means that the needles that you pick up along the way you do have a room to put them time to see them um and you know actually having that that day day planner so i think i saw someone asking about what does the day like well we we didn't we've just got rid of appointment lands so we don't have appointments uh, well, we have obviously appointments and people see us, but not a set schedule for it anymore, because if you are working like this, it would be crazy to have a scheduled 10 minute appointment for someone who's going to take 30 minutes and the, the clinicians adapt their own day to that. How fantastic. I mean, there's a lot of um, ownership in this model where everyone gets the best because they're able to perform to the top of their license. But I think there is, there, there's a lot of calls about wanting, people wanting to see your appointment books. Clearly, that you go against the IGPR, GDPR requirements in this country. But it does show how phenomenally powerful it, this model is and what a difference it can make about in terms of the care it provides. And, um, David, I think um, there are loads of questions that are still pouring and clearly people are absolutely uh, besides themselves with this amazing model that you've created and resulted in. But the question, I mean, we are, we are coming close to the end, so I'm going to wrap this up with one question. In putting this model together and delivering this, what did you see was the biggest challenge that you faced as you rolled it out? And how did you work that through? Well, honestly, the biggest challenge throughout it has been an assumption that what we did before and i don't necessarily mean the model but you know sitting with each person is the best thing for them is the way that is the best thing for that patient and their care uh, it's trying to bring people into a radically different way of working which doesn't suit everyone and assure them that it's safe and you can deliver good quality care in a different way um I don't think it would be very different to when people first adopted telephone triage models. Um, you know, the jump from face to face only to that was large. And this is larger again in the sense that we're now automating lots of structures. So I think assurance that you can deliver good clinical care like this has been the biggest challenge. And I'm going to sound a little bit like a geek, but it's 
you do that through data and, and outcomes and you measure what you do. I love measuring. All my staff know that I love my graphs and I love having data and I love knowing what goes on and how long things take and how many people do this and how many people do that. And that's because doing this blind, like not knowing what effects each action you have, it's like driving down the road with one hand over your eyes because you can roughly get to where you're going, but you, you do take a few more risks than if you know where exactly where you're going and you have the sat nav on. David, I know um, when QI was invented and put in place, um, they didn't know that here in primary care had someone who was already using QI by different names. People like you who actually made such a difference of trying out new ideas, studying the ideas, looking at the impact it was having, and then constantly changing the processes. When we talk about the plan, do, study, act, cycle. But you were doing it way before people were thinking about in health service. And um, I remember when I was introduced to your model the first time, I knew to steal a word from my kids' vocabulary, this meeting was going to be a blast. But wow, um, this is an evening that's really left an amazing impression. There are questions still pouring in and you can see how actively people are animated and engaged with this because it has really touched so many hearts, so many clinicians, so many people, and so many frontline uh, uh, patients and citizens because this affects them. And it's a frustration that many of us have had, which you've solved. I think um, you do exemplify how primary care can be provided very differently, David. And it can deliver amazing outcomes for patients, amazing outcomes for the people who work in it because they are equally tired and wanting to do the right thing. And most importantly, for the communities that we are looking to serve here. So thank you so much for today evening. It has been an absolutely amazing evening. And I know from all the questions, you, you can be rest assured you are about to be getting 10,000 requests of um, visits to your practice. Um, in the chat box for everyone, there's a link that's been put down by our amazing Thai, which talks about um, how you found this. Please register for our next event. Our next event is on the 18th of May at 7 p.m where we have another mover and shaker from the world of primary care, Professor Rebecca Malby, whose report in primary care was presented before the Health Select Committee a couple of months ago. Please use the link, register yourself, and if I may please thank the amazing communication department at East London Foundation Trust and the amazing Marion, who makes sure in the background this works to a T. It's been great seeing you all this evening. Wishing you well and have a good evening. Bye-bye.